Welcome everyone. This program is one of a series of eight webinars that have been captured to help brain injury survivors, caregivers, educators, healthcare professionals, and other community stakeholders better understand brain injury and provide support to those who are living with the aftermath of brain trauma. This series of presentations was originally designed to help parents and educators assist children and youth with brain injury successfully transition back into their school environments. While many of the examples and references made throughout the presentation are school-centric, the overall content has proven very helpful and relevant to most families coping with brain injury. The content of this webinar presentation specifically focuses on the impact of concussion on learning. I am Mimi Gold. I'm a consultant to families and schools focused on improving recovery after brain injury. And I'm delighted to present this program to you today. This webinar has been created many thanks to the professional expertise and volunteer efforts of the members of the Georgia Brain and Spinal Injury Trust Fund Commission's Children and Youth Committee. The Brain Injury Association has also been a collaborative partner in this effort, for whom we are forever grateful. The production of this program was funded thanks to the Avenues of Service Grant from the Rotary Club of Gwinnett County. We are grateful to everyone that played a part in making this program possible. We've got lots of valuable information to share with you, so let's get started. We have set the following goals for this presentation. We want you to understand the impact of a concussion on the brain and to learn how concussions vary greatly in outcomes and to understand why we must manage concussion symptoms. To understand a two-pronged plan, not a single way, of monitoring both the return to sports and a return to learning. So, what's a concussion? I'm not a believer in reading, but this slide I want you to read with me. The CDC says a concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury that results from a bump to the head or, note, by hit to the body that causes the head and brain to move, which is what's so critically, rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement causes the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull. Thus stretching, we'll come back to the word stretching, and damaging brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. All right, now let's do some details related to concussions that most people don't know, but educators and people who work with children who have had injuries need to understand. Most people do not notice, not lose consciousness. Concussion really is the movement of the brain inside the skull, the rotation of it inside that skull, and that skull is bony. Inside the front and the back of a skull are bony projections that are meant to stabilize the brain. But when the brain is moving or rotating, it can be damaged moving back and forth inside the skull. Concussion causes often are not seen in scans. Remember that word stretching I said before? Stretching or shearing injuries often are not seen in scans. So some of the effects will not be identified through pictures. Instead, they'll be identified by noting the child or young adult's actual functioning, behaviors. Those behaviors after injury are usually called symptoms that we look for. Those can appear 24 to 72 hours. So doctors strongly recommend in concussion, identified concussions, the child rest there usually is a particular prescription provided for that child. All activity, remember, all activity 
that demands concentration does worsen symptoms. We don't want that to happen in the first 24 to 72 hours. But the good news is if you treat a concussion properly, 80% of them after a single concussion will recover. Smaller numbers, 15%, those difficulties or symptoms may persist for three months because we possibly haven't treated them well. If there's a multiple event, thanks to football and all those revelations, that second impact syndrome that we've learned so much about, those recoveries will take longer and some have lifelong problems as a result. Did it go to? Well, children, especially young children, are much more vulnerable to brain injury than adults for a given acceleration force. Um, children's brains are largely not myelinated. That's the coating of nerve fibers. It helps transmission, but it also gives strength. So nerve fibers in children are more easily torn apart. Nerve fibers uh, in children uh, also are more accelerated from the standpoint of the brains and the children are lighter in weight. So it takes less acceleration to put that brain in motion than the heavier brain of an adult. The brains of children are also housed in disproportionately large skulls. The skull of a child by the age of five has reached about 90% of an adult skull diameter. But those big skulls are on very weak Next, and so that bobblehead doll effect also sets up the youth brain to have greater injury. The metabolic cascade of concussion, the excitotoxic shock issue, is uh, more easily put in play in children than it is in adults. That's another risk factor for children. Children tend to have, as a group, um, older equipment, coaches that are least, much less experienced than adults. And of course, kids don't have informed consent. So there are a lot of things going on that puts kids at greater risk than adults. Important to keep in mind that information because it relates to pediatric children's care related to concussion. So if we know all these things can happen, what do we need to do? We have to put in place a management system to ensure that the symptoms are relieved. So the goal, as you can see written here, is truly to limit cognitive activity, brain activity, to a level that is tolerable for the student without those symptoms coming back again. If we manage those symptoms, we can ensure recovery. So we have to consider effects that we might see. It includes headaches, dizziness, noise, visual issues, fatigue, memory, and emotional reactions. I read it quickly, I know, but we'll come back to each one of them. The main goal is to reduce the impact on symptoms, which will equal reduced brain stress, which will increase recovery. In the meantime, while we're trying to reduce those impacts, we put in place adjustments. That's a medical term for the school term, short-term modifications. Students will need modifications on their return to school, so we ensure the effects are continuing to be reduced. Now, both physical and Cognitive rest have to happen. So we all understand what physical rest is. Take it easy, lay back, don't be involved in stressful physical activity. But cognitive rest is not clear to most people. It means using the brain in less compromised ways. The brain must not be stressed. We have to start slowly. We start slowly and evaluate where we trigger a symptom. As we tolerate more and more activity, which will vary among kids, for example, 
the child might start out reading for 10 minutes and encounter a headache or encounter some dizziness. So we back off and we say, the child will read for five minutes until those symptoms don't appear. And then we can increase the amount of reading time. The same is true for a physical activity. The child can take a walk for a quarter of a mile without dizziness, without headache, and then can be increased. So as your toleration improves, we can improve the amount of time that the child or adolescent can do the activity, or we can increase the intensity of the task. So reading the content might be increased, so it demands more concentration. So how do we manage it? There are three stages that we have to meet. You can see initial three to six weeks approximately varies by kids. Beyond six to eight weeks are smaller numbers, and beyond three to four months are the tiniest numbers. So the message is, the more we do up front, maybe the better things will turn out. But we must, in all cases, recognize, document that a concussion has occurred. It must be a certified evaluator. We must notify the school and the family. Everyone has to be involved, and often the family physician. Through the doctor, through a school certified evaluator, we often can identify symptoms and we can select a case manager. And we set in place a reevaluator for all the plans. So as the child's recovering, there are reevaluation stages. We have to create a written plan, an adjustment plan, and a rest plan that includes preventive, preventive physical interactions and classroom adjustments. Now that's all good and well to have a plan, but somebody has to track the recovery. We have to monitor the tolerance level, the endurance level, and the reduction of symptoms. You can move to the next step only when the symptoms do not reoccur, notice, for up to 24 hours. So if that child was reading a text for 15 minutes and it's everything seemed fine, but that night they had a headache, it would be important to look at that goal. Now, beyond that normal progression of stage three to six weeks, is about a 10 to 20% population of kids who will need to consider a more complex plan at school, something beyond an adjustment plan, something beyond some short-term modifications. We need a 504 to continue monitoring the symptoms and to establish what things need to be adjusted. Sadly, about one to five percent of the population may truly need special education because there have been major changes in the child's behaviors. An IEP might need to be considered, oh, and it's very important, a neuropsychological evaluation probably needs to be completed. Okay, remember I quickly ran through all those symptoms, so let's go through each one of them. As a staff member, or a parent, or a therapist, or the child themselves, headache is the number one difficulty after concussion. Its biggest problem is it can distract that child from being able to concentrate. And worse than that, the intensity changes over a day. Things in school like fluorescent lighting, noises, and high focusing on a task can trigger those symptoms. So what can you do? First of all, you have to give kids breaks and they don't need to hear they get a time out and they really don't need to hear the words they want a rest break. They take that as an isolation of making them different. They do benefit from a discussion about a brain rest. The rest is to care for your brain. Kids seem to understand that better. While we're having the headaches, we need to identify what aggravates it, what triggers it, and reduce exposing them to that. If the rests are planned, 
you also need to have in place, at school especially, the availability of a nurse's office and a quiet place the child himself or herself knows they can go to to rest. The second one, symptoms, dizziness, lightheadedness. In school, physically, due to the concussion, there could have been injury to the vestibular system that will affect balance in inner ear. So dizziness may take time to disappear. Also, as you stand up quickly or sit down quickly or change your position, you can observe when children have dizziness because you'll see their body wobble. Often visual stimulus such as computer screens, lighting that's harsh, reading text that's very tight and font is small, that the eyes will literally begin to have rapid eye movements, that is observable. All these troubles are really a problem when the kids are transferring to the next class in the hall. We need to watch out for those. So what do we do? Number one, it's easy to reduce the visual stimuli when you identify it. So if lighting's a problem, you could reduce the lighting. Allow the student to put their head down if symptoms worsen because of dizziness. They need that place to rest. Also, they need extra time to travel to get from class to class. It would be really helpful for the child to have a buddy walking to class more than anything because just in case if there is a problem, that student can run and get help. Next one, symptoms, observable symptoms. Visual sensitivity, double vision, blurry vision. These are not quite as observable. So we'll depend on the student to tell you or ask for help on visual tasks that seem confusing to them. They will have difficulty with visual presentations, PowerPoints on the screen, screen work, artificial lighting, and print. Often kids need varied fonts, background colors. So what do we do? Number one, we reduce the amount of screen time. We know that backlighting from computers and phones is hard on the visual system at first. We need to reduce the brightness of the screen and possibly change to color background. There's no reason why a student can't wear a hat, a cap with a visor, or sunglasses at school if it helps them function. It's also important to consider if they're having blurry vision, I cannot imagine what reading must be like, but they won't tell you, especially teens, because they don't want to look different. But it would help to give them the opportunity and permission to do their work in textbooks on tape or to set up the computerized textbooks with voiceover. And please turn off fluorescent lights wherever possible or seat the child away from the majority of fluorescent lighting. Now, if we know the kid's having visual sensitivity and we know he has blurry vision, it makes sense to seat the child in the middle of an activity and not at the edges where they're closer to see better. The next symptom, which is observable, is noise sensitivity. You will see kids cover their ears. They will do it in noisy environments like cafeterias and the shop, music classes, always and in the gym. Now, keep in mind that most of these kids who've had an identified concussion are not going to be in the gym. They will not be able to take physical education without a doctor's permission. They will also be restricted from organized sports, those practices. There's no return to sports until they are asymptomatic, which means there have been no symptoms that have occurred in the last 24 hours. So what can we do? Number one, kids are really social and they need to be social. So why can't this student invite a couple of his bodies and go to a quiet area to have lunch? Do they have to go to band or choir or shop classes for a while? 
No. Could those be removed till later when they've adjusted? Do we have to consider maybe some technology reduction? Yes. Could we use headphones in class or in noisy places when they have to read or when they have to do a task that demands concentration without noise? Same rule as far as noise goes. Let them go early to get to class extra time and give them a buddy so they can avoid some of the crowding. This one is long, as you can see from all the bullets, so I'll try and go a little slower. The main difficulty with learning when kids go back to school is they have major difficulties with maintaining attention, concentrating, endurance, which leads to problems with remembering information. The challenge for these kids is when you are instructing with new information and new material that they've never heard before, it demands high concentration for which the brain tires quickly. As a result, after listening or reading brand new information, they will have great difficulty with recalling specifics and applying it to previously learned materials. And we all know from research to learn new, the best way is to hook it with the old. So long-term learning will be affected too. If they are demanding concentration, it will reduce their endurance. So you will see them fade physically. You may see their bodies go limp or their eyes get glassy. Watch their expressions. They will have major troubles with test taking because of the distraction. They're so overwhelmed by so much information on the page. They reach frustration because they know this stuff used to be easy for them before. Can we imagine facing a whole new me during a test? They will need extra time because of their endurance. A major problem with standardized testing is the size of the print, the concentration it does take to do that leads to fatigue. And then you ask the child to use a Scantron sheet, which demands moving their eyes from the standardized test form with small print across the page to a Scantron and mark an answer, often going in the wrong answer slot. So we have to do some major adjustments with kids having concentration difficulties. We know we have to build up endurance for reading. We start at 15 minutes with all kids who have concussions. We have to adjust both the time and the intensity. So for example, if there are 25 items on a task, you reduce it to 10. We try at all possible in the immediate recovery stage to avoid testing, to avoid projects, to put them off to at least a couple of weeks if we can. We must provide extra time for completing non-standardized tests. It is very helpful due to their dizziness, visual complication, and concentrations to give them a reader for oral test taking so that someone sitting next to them and can read the test with them to ensure that they're actually reading it accurately. Any standardized testing, it's proposed that the children not take them. It may require a 504 plan to let them take them later after recovery. Related to testing also, which means communications with all teachers on the child's team, Please only let the child study for one test a night, especially during the exam period. It will take a special schedule for the concussion child. Also, it's helpful for the child because of concentration for the teacher to give the child pre-printed notes, like an outline with large spacing between headings so the child can write the notes in the correct headings and not have to take so much time moving back and forth from listening to putting notes in the right place. You might also consider a note taker or getting a copy of a student's notes, a good student in the class, 
or have a scribe who sits next to the child and takes the notes for them. Bottom line, if you can break up the task, break up the homework, break up the reading into smaller chunks, you will know the child has a better chance at learning new information. Next, symptom that you won't see particularly. Mom and dad will be able to report and you should speak to them about sleep disturbances. Children who have had concussions have great changes in sleep. Often they're sleeping during the middle of the day and wide awake at night. This excessive fatigue going back and forth to school with limited sleep really hampers memory and attention. They just don't have the energy to do it. Now we've got a vicious cycle that'll happen. If you have insufficient sleep, you're drowsy at school, you want to go take a nap, and you further screw up your sleep cycle. So what do we do? A couple of choices instigated by many schools is don't have the kids come to school so early. Have them come later in the day, around 10.30 or 11, and have a shortened day initially. And allow rest breaks, and remember, I call them brain rests, for the child whenever they need them. Are you hanging in there? This is the last one. This is the last symptom that's most important for concussion kids. It's about their emotions and their moods, which swing Understandably, if you've had a concussion and you know you're not the same, you're going to be irritable. You're going to have tremendous sadness because of fear of not knowing who you are because you're different than you were before. There will be nervousness. They want to perform. They want to do their best. Frustration is easily reached and anxiety builds. There can be aggression. Isolation is the natural, though. The kids withdraw, and they don't tell you what's going on. They don't want you to know. They don't want to re be removed from the regular school world. So what do we do? We have to encourage, but I mean explain, what the adjustments are for. That it's for their brain. Their brains hurt. Their brain's not working, but it's going to get better. If they do the adjustments, the brain will get better. They need to hear that if they don't do the adjustments, there will not be recovery. They have to be encouraged. Sometimes they won't speak to their parents and tell them what's really going on. They come home from school and go to their room and close the door because they're exhausted. Maybe a special teacher at school, maybe a neighborhood mentor is somebody they could tell. Maybe it's a coach from a sport they've loved. It has to be somebody they trust. Parents need to be trusting, meanwhile, but they might share that need for talk with other mentors. You have to prepare them in advance if there are going to be changes in routine because of energy. As I said, we have to identify an adult person. But at school, everybody assumes it is the counselor. Maybe the child already has a teacher they really love at school. I'm sure that teacher would volunteer to be able to have that student go there for a special permit, a timeout space to go. And again, encourage that rest time, that brain rest. So. If we have a student who is not buying into the necessity of following medical orders and limiting their activities, we have to have a lot of time to talk. Counseling is not a bad idea, but parents' trust and talking is critical. Best friends talk. Building a circle of friends is really important. Student is the only one who can tell you what's really happening inside their body and inside their brain. Much patience must be had to encourage the child to share those feelings. It was January 10, 2005. 
I was 17 years old and my high school basketball team was playing a varsity game and it was around the second quarter and I was going up for a rebound and as I came down um, the back of my head collided with the top of another girl's head. The next day after the day I got hit, I went to school, and I was really sick. I knew I had a concussion because I suffered through a concussion my seventh grade year. I had all the symptoms, dizzy, nauseous. Um, I couldn't focus in school. I continued to play a second game after that, and I passed out after the second game in the locker room. Basically, I was bedridden in my house for about six months straight, I slept on the couch because of the light. We had to put dark shoes over the windows. Um, my mom and my sister had to help me walk around. Um, I lost my balance. I couldn't really get that back for quite a while. I didn't know it could get this bad. All athletes have a strong will. And since we're young, we know that we have to suck it up, suck things up, whether you know you sprain your ankle or you hurt your finger. You just go in the game and you shake it off and you don't complain, you don't cry. But this is a brain and head we're talking about and you can't suck it up. So unfortunately, instead of missing a game, I missed the season. I missed sports for the rest of my life and I missed out on a great life that I could have had. Athletes need to know, if you think you have a concussion, don't hide it, report it. It's better to miss one game than the entire season. You can find information on concussions at www.cdc.gov slash concussion and youth sports. That's a perfect example of a teenager who's an athlete who didn't tell, who didn't talk, who lost what she loved the most. Don't let that happen to your student. So let's move on. So you saw in that particularly moving speech that it's really necessary to have a plan. If we don't plan and you have negative impact on that brain, the long-term quality of that life truly can be affected. Without intervention, hope goes because they get worse. Symptoms that are not treated are exacerbated. They can get worse. Sadly, there's great research to prove from jail population inmates, juvenile delinquency populations, up to 60% of the kids, the inmates, the juveniles, had one or more untreated concussions and TBIs. So it can lead to a totally unbalanced negative life. So what does planning help make happen? Number one, we set tolerable limits on brain stimulation. We control the amount of stimulation that's happening in the brain and it reduces the symptoms. Symptoms do not reappear in activity. So the brain gets better. Giving the brain a break allows time for the healing that has to happen. Adults support trust and hope for the kids so recovery will improve. So what kind of a plan? First of all, it has to be a brain safe plan. I'm gonna to jump to the bottom for a moment that will explain the top. The Children's Hospital in Philadelphia did a study of 193 patients who had concussions. 54% of them had a physical plan to control their physical activities, but only 34 of those kids had a cognitive plan. So what was the result of that? Number one, a brain safe plan demands you have a medical diagnosis and there are school forms involved in that. There is a progression of graded activities that don't trigger symptoms. They're identified by certified examiners and doctors and specialists in the school system. Activities with increasing volume and increasing workload and reduced restrictions encourage recovery. But it has to be a two 
pronged plan that has to be both a cognitive plan and a physical plan, both of them demanding brain rest that truly leads to recovery. So a what I call stepwise plan measures progress in defined steps. So when there's been no backwash of a symptom reappearing and the student receives, oop, I need to pause and rephrase that. When a reoccurrence actually happens and a symptom reoccurs while the child's doing an activity, the rule is the student receives a no pass and they must go back to the previous step. So it's always one forward, one back, one forward, one back until there's all clear. So ready? Let's summarize. Early recognition is the key to recovery. Medical knowledge shared with school and family teams can lead to a complete recovery for a single concussion. My name is Heather O'Reilly. I'm a member of the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, and I'm a three-time gold medal Olympian. I've been playing soccer for 22 years now, and it is such a huge part of my life. Good stuff. Keep it up. It is so important to stay fit and stay healthy, but while doing that, you need to stay safe. It is just so crucial to stay educated about different injuries and concussions in particular. I was at school and I was playing kickball with my friends. I was trying to catch the ball and I hit heads with another boy. Then when I fell down, I hit my head on the asphalt. And he came up from school that day and he was really off. And when he was doing his homework, he was even writing his letters backwards, which was very unusual for Aiden. We kept him home from football, took him to the doctor the next day. And then the next day, you know, the doctor said, oh, he has a con mild concussion. You can't see it on a blood test. You can't see it on a scan, but it's a very real injury. What's most important is that we distinguish it from a common belief that a concussion is loss of consciousness. Concussions due to a rapid rotation or spinning of the brain. An athlete gets struck in the head and it spins very quickly. When it spins, it puts a stress on the brain that causes it to stop functioning. Symptoms for concussion usually fall into four categories. The first category is physical. It can be dizziness, headache, balance problems, nausea, visual problems. The second category is usually cognitive problems, memory problems, attention issues. The third group of symptoms is usually emotional or mood symptoms. The kids tend to appear irritable, easily frustrated, sometimes anxious, sometimes nervous, sometimes tearful for no reason. The fourth category is usually disturbance of sleep. Kids have a hard time falling asleep or waking frequently in the night, and in the end, they feel as though they don't get good rest. The first thing we do for a child that had a concussion is put them at rest. And there's really two types of rest. There's physical rest. It's avoiding things that are physically demanding, running or bicycling or anything that really would count as exercise. The second type of rest is called cognitive rest, basically the avoidance of activities that demand concentration or focus, reason or memory. Well, for children, the obvious thing is their schoolwork. We'll try to reduce their schoolwork or eliminate it for the first few days. And then when we reintroduce it, we reintroduce it gradually. Reading for pleasure, even though it's fun, it still demands concentration. Video games are really nothing but reaction, memory, and focus. Same thing is true of playing musical instruments, playing games like chess. So while they're recovering, we try to minimize those activities. The doctor said no recess, no gym, limited play make sure he doesn't have a headache. And he was good the whole week. And two weeks later, he was at a football game. He kept getting hit, play after play. At halftime, he said, my head hurts. And I told the coach, his head hurts. But he was the quarterback at the time. So they kept him in the game. By the end of the game, he vomited walking off the field. Couldn't really describe how he felt, just 
that he was here, but not really here. My head was killing me. I felt like I was out of this world. Aiden came to me after multiple head injuries, uh, each of which did not seem terribly significant, but in some it made him have a lot of symptoms. He was really incapacitated for a while, mostly by headaches. He had tremendous school intolerance, and he was one of the slowest to recover I've had recently. It can be really difficult to know when a child has sustained a concussion and when they're safe to return to play. There's no MRI scan to determine the severity of a concussion. We have to use all the tools available, history taking, physical exam, and we also have neurocognitive testing that we can do. The number of people who sustain concussion sustain long-term neurocognitive injury. In other words, they have a higher chance of having dementia, depression, Parkinson's disease, problem with memory, Alzheimer's, and the like. We were playing volleyball, and I missed one of the balls. So I was running over to get the ball. I was bending down, and then a girl probably twice my size. She kind of, like, did a hockey check into me, and I fell back to the floor, and my head hit my arm. I was very confused. I wasn't exactly sure of what just happened. But then I just got up and I continued to play. I didn't go to a teacher because I was confused. I didn't think anything was wrong with me, but I was feeling very dizzy afterwards. But this is also my second concussion in one year. I got my first one in a softball incident last spring, so this one was much worse than my last one. A number of repetitive, low-level concussions can really accumulate and cause big problems. A rare side effect devastating consequence of head injury in children is second impact syndrome. A child returns to play prematurely and then through a second injury has a devastating head injury that results in sudden death. Fortunately, if an athlete sustains one or two concussions over the course of their career, they're very unlikely to have any long-term problems. Most athletes recover from a concussion within about a month. The real dangers of concussion occur when it's not recognized and it's not treated properly. Sports injuries get a lot of the attention and are ones that we typically think of with concussions. The vast majority of them actually happen outside of the sports arena. A lot of them are slip and fall, sometimes assault, and then a lot are just simple accidents. More often, concussions in children are missed. Perhaps they even take a fall at a playground and they don't come home saying, Mom or Dad, I have a concussion. They get back to sports activity perhaps too early. What we're trying to do is raise awareness about these issues. Concussion occurs commonly, and if recognized, we can change the natural history for that child in a very positive way. I've been around many teammates who have had concussions. In a contact sport, there are risks. The most important thing for athletes is to communicate if you're not feeling well, especially if it has something to do with your head. Although every athlete wants to stay in the game and prove that they're tough with concussions, it's important to just communicate your symptoms and know when to sit out sometimes. Work hard, have fun, but be safe. If you were ever confused in a situation like this, immediately go to an adult. I probably would have gotten help much quicker than I did. But I didn't really think there was anything wrong with me at the time. I would have done everything differently. I would have not let them watch TV. I would have not let them play video games. If a child hits their head, even though they might seem okay, you still need to limit their activity and you have to monitor them. Sometimes you don't want to see because they're kids and you want them to have fun and go out and play. But if you don't let them rest in the beginning, you could end up the way that we ended up. The brain needs to rest. Dear Lord, bless your day. Good happy birthday to you. Go You'll see there extensive list of resources for you, including articles and websites that you'll want to look at. Please keep in mind that the CDC has a new wonderful site has been updated with lots of concussion information. Thank you very much for listening. This webinar is just one in a series of eight that offers great support to families struggling with brain injury. We encourage you to view each webinar 
that best applies to you. These webinars and other great resources can be found on these two websites. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Have a great day.